sponsored by Visa 1971. The three areas would be politics, society, and education. The three speakers and their topics will be Yuyun Bon, What Next, Collision Course in America, tomorrow, Abby Hoffman, Revolution for the Hell of It, and, on and then Max Rafferty, Student Activism and Education. Each of the speeches will be here on Central Campus at noon, and in case of rain, they will be in the armory. Today's speaker, Mr. Julian Bond, representative to the Georgia House of Representatives, began his own political career somewhat on a collision course with America, at least what it feels a political representative should say. Mr. Bond's supportment of the following statement by the students by the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in 1966 uh, catapulted him into national problems. That statement was the following. The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee has a right and a responsibility to dissent with United States foreign policy on any issue when it sees fit. The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee now states its opposition to United States involvement in Vietnam on these grounds. We believe the United States government has been deceptive in its claims of concern for the freedom of the Vietnamese people, just as the government has been deceptive in claiming concern for, just for the freedom of colored people in such other countries as the Dominican Republic, the Congo, South Africa, Rhodesia, and the United States itself. We therefore encourage those Americans who prefer to use our energy in building democratic forms within this country. We believe that work in the civil rights movement is a valid alternative to the draft. We urge all Americans to seek this alternative, knowing full well that it may cost them their lives as painfully as in Vietnam. As the result of supporting this statement, Julian Bond was prevented from taking office in January 1966 by his fellow legislators. After winning a second election in February 1966 to fill his own vacant seat, a special House committee again voted to bar him from membership in the legislature. He won a third election in November 1966, and in de December 1966, the United States Supreme Court ruled unanimously that the Georgia House had erred in refusing him his seat. And in January 1967, he took the oath of office and became a member of the Georgia House of Representatives. In the Georgia House, Mr. Bond serves as a member of the Education, Insurance, and State Institutions and Properties Committee. Among some of his other credits, he is a member of the Board of Directors of the Southern Conference Educational Fund a member of the advisory board of the proposed Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Library. While serving with SNCC, he was the communications director. And some evidence of his ability in this area is that he has poems and articles which have appeared in Negro Digest, Motive, Rights and Reviews, Ramparts, and other magazines and journals. He was the first co-chairman of the National Conference for New Politics and now serves as a member of the NCNP Executive Board. As you're well aware, during the 1968 Democratic Convention, he was nominated for vice president, but declined on the fact, because of the fact that he was not of age. So without any other further ado, I'd like to introduce Mr. Julian Bond. Thank you a great deal, he said. <laughs> it's the usual custom of speakers like myself to begin by telling the audience what a great pleasure it is to be here. So it's a great pleasure to be here. <laughs> it's also usually the custom 
of almost any kind of speaker, whether it's a minister in the pulpit on Sunday morning or a politician out on the stump soliciting votes or a lecturer in the college classroom or on an occasion like this for almost any speaker to begin his remarks with a series of hilarious anecdotes. Now the purpose of these anecdotes is several fold. They are first to convince the audience that the speaker is a good person, that he has a sense of humor just like ordinary people, and also to make his speech seem longer than it really is. <laughs> so here are a couple of hilarious anecdotes. <laughs> Both of these anecdotes are about my profession, the practice of politics, which is the world's second oldest profession, and the first has to do with the Vice President of the United States, but that's not it. has to do with the fact that many Americans, not just now that Mr. Agnew is the vice president, but when Mr. Humphrey was vice president before him and Mr. Johnson the vice president before him, there's always been confusion in the minds of the American population about the precise function and nature of the vice presidency. And that's because we've not been privilege to discover the very important jobs and tasks that these dedicated and devoted men have been asked to carry out. For example, unknown to most of us, over the last couple of days, there was a violent electrical storm in Washington, so strong that it knocked out all the electricity in and around the White House causing, of course, all of the machinery in the White House that runs by electricity to come to a halt. And when the electricity was restored, President Nixon called in Vice President Agnew and asked him if he wouldn't undertake the very important job of discovering what the correct time was so that all the clocks in the White House could be put back on the right time. But quite naturally, being nobody's fool, <laughs> Vice President Agnew went right away to the one place where you can be sure of getting the correct time all the time, and that's the Naval Observatory, where they have these very expensive timepieces that will give you the correct time down to the last millionth of a second. He called them up and was in such great haste, he neglected to identify himself, but simply said, please give me the correct time. Well, the young man who answered the telephone had no idea he was talking to the vice president. He said, no. He said, this is not the telephone company. This is a government installation. We exist here to give the correct time to the Army, the Navy, the Marines, and the Air Force. We don't have the time to give the time to every Tom, Dick, and Spiro who call up on the phone. Well. The vice president was chagrined. He very quickly identified himself, said, I guess you don't know who you're talking to. I am the vice president. I insist on being told the correct time. The young man was apologetic, a little embarrassed, said, I'm awfully sorry, sir. I had no idea. Of course, I'll tell you the correct time. Said, if you're a civilian, it's 6 o'clock. If you're in the armed forces, it's 1,800 hours. But if you're the vice president of the United States, the big hand is on 12. <laughs> now, this other anecdote. In the part of the country I'm from, would be called a rib tickler or a thigh slapper. 
out here in the heartland of America, it'd probably be called risque. <laughs> or even off color. But I'm sure all of us like to believe that we're living in an age of certain kinds of new freedoms. People do things now they would not have done two or three years ago, uh, dress in ways they would not have dressed two or three years ago, have a different attitude about some things than they had some years ago. This is about the visit. 12 or 18 months ago of the President of France to the United States. Now those of you who keep up with such things will remember there was an immense controversy surrounding his visit. No one was really sure why he had come, whether this was simply the ordinary social visit of the head of one country to the United States or whether he was bringing some important new information about the crisis in the Middle East or the war against the innocent people of Southeast Asia. And as a result, an enterprising journalist in Washington decided that he would interview a series of important people in Washington, hoping that one of them would reveal the true nature of the visit. And so he interviewed the Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare, and the Secretary of Defense, and the Secretary of the Interior, and went through a long list of important people in Washington, saving the most important person, the person who is reputed to be closest to President Nixon, until the very last. And that, of course, is the Attorney General, Mr. John Mitchell. And he called Mr. Mitchell up at his residence, and when the telephone was answered, was disappointed to discover that not only was Mr. Mitchell not at home, but that he couldn't be reached by telephone. But fortuitously, <coughs> his lovely wife, Martha, was there. Well, knowing her reputation as a political wizard, the reporter decided that he would put the question to her. The question was, what does your husband think of President Pompidou's new French position? And, and she said, <coughs> And that winsome, sort of cute, southern way of hers. I don't know what he thinks of it, but it hurts my back. One uh, final thing, I'm sure that a great many of you have seen the information coming largely from Senator Irwin's Senate committee about the surveillance activities of the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, and the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And all of us, I'm sure, are quite shocked to discover that this is widespread practice in the United States of the government spying on private citizens. And it's not at all unlikely to believe that as widespread as this activity is, having spread to the American college campus, that there's someone here now among you uh, fulfilling the function of spying on you. Now, it's very difficult to tell who these people are. You can't tell them by their dress. They have both long hair and short hair. You can't tell them by their sex. They're both male and female. You can't tell them by their race. They're unfortunately both black and white. You 
can't tell them really by their status in the academic hierarchy because they're both administrators, faculty members, and on um, far too many occasions, students. But it's relatively easy to pick out the students who are doing this fine. All you must do is think about which one of your fellows has become suddenly affluent. It's reputed to be true that the Federal Bureau of Investigation will pay as much as $35 a week to hire college students to spy on other college students. Now, because this is an open society, more than I had bargained for, as a matter of fact, because this is an open society, wouldn't it be better for everyone if the person who is here now doing this would find some way to identify himself so that all of us could better know who you are? And if you don't care to do it publicly, you meet me later. I'll give you something to report about. Hmm. Well... I'd like to talk for a few minutes about the continuing and ongoing problem of race and its connection to politics for a few minutes. Race, because the fact of race has uh, colored my life. Uh, politics, because it's my profession and because unlike some people who believe that Politics is the art of the possible, or some others who believe that politics is the art of compromise. I have always believed that politics is the art of seeing who gets how much of what from whom. Black people being the who who haven't gotten any from you know who. <laughs> now, at this particular point in American history, in the month of May 1971, we're in the second year now of the new decade of the 1970s. And it seems fair to say in a very general sense that there is a great deal of confusion in all areas of American life. Now this doesn't exist because the majority population doesn't know what the problems are. It exists simply and solely because the majority of the population either professes ignorance about methods of solving the problem, or because they have no real interest in seeing the problem solved. The particular and much more specific confusion surrounding black people and the traditional difficulties we have had with what is called the American way of life stems entirely from our status in this country as a colonial people, and from the fact that we are increasingly being forced to employ the methods and techniques of the colonial subject to escape from the domination of the colonial power. Now that is an old analysis made many, many years ago by many, many different kinds of people, but despite its age and validity, there are constant objections made to it most often by political scientists and historians and other people who study the course of American history. The gist of their argument against the colonial analysis runs in this fashion. First, we are told that black people couldn't possibly be colonial subjects because we are nationalized Americans. Then we are told that the Constitution of the United States guarantees equal citizenship and that our sub-constitutional status is simply a matter of chance, not of design. Then we are told that the racism that affects us is based on historical preference and not on economic profit, the way it traditionally has been in the classic African, Asian, or Latin American version of colonialism. But as all of us know, black people are citizens only in the very narrow sense 
that we have to meet certain obligations to the state without receiving all of the corresponding benefits of citizenship. For example, both black and white young men have the nearly equal opportunity to demonstrate their fidelity to the government of the United States by serving in her armed forces, but in some peculiar fashion, particularly throughout the most recent history of our aggression against the innocent peoples of Southeast Asia, black young men have managed to become first in war, last in peace, and seldom in the hearts of their countrymen. Now, we, like almost all other Americans, came here as immigrants, but most immigrants came voluntarily, looking for freedom and a chance to survive. Our ancestors tended to come in chains, husband torn from wife, child separated from mother. In a land where family and education are venerated, we were denied the chance to learn and to maintain what presently passes for a stable family unit. In a country populated with sufferers from religious persecution, we found a strange and alien religion forced upon us. While we came from a land whose inhabitants believed in communalism and the extended family, we found created here a system of mercantile capitalism which precisely fitted the cash box mentality of the founding fathers. From that day to this, the separate status of American black people has been a fact. But the argument goes on. It's said that black people enjoy equal legal status here with all other Americans. And of course, on paper, that's quite largely true. But the plain facts are that certain constitutionally guaranteed rights, like the right to vote and enjoy other forms of social and political participation, these are still subjected to intense debate, not just in the part of the country I am from, but so we are told in the corridors of Uncle Strom's cabin itself. In short, we are in what you might call, with some kindness, bad shape. We live and work in situations provided for by the majority, not by us. We exist at the pleasure, the sufferance, and for the entertainment of the American majority. And the evidence is rather quickly mounting that that existence itself may soon be called into question. Part of the difficulty, of course, is that the traditional solutions to the ethnic immigrant dilemma, solutions employed with great success by other groups of immigrants to the United States, have not fit our situation entirely. Economic development, for example, is a favorite tool of the poverty-stricken immigrant to lift himself from ghetto poverty and degradation into the mainstream of American economic life. And economic development has done some things for black people. It has created a class of black millionaires in the publishing, insurance, and hair straightening field, but it's done relatively little for the masses of black people. Traditional pressure group politics has won some badly needed reforms for our group, but these reforms are proving nearly impossible to make secure in a colonial society. A second difficulty is that the traditional kinds of coalition politics we have played have failed to build the kind of majority American politics that any insurgent movement eventually needs to become in order to be successful. The traditional kinds of coalitions of black people, organized labor, the more enlightened church leadership, they have failed to bring about the beloved society that was the rather optimistic dream of the early 1960s. 
The American labor movement, for example, has most recently begun to show its true colors, particularly as black people stopped making traditional labor-connected demands, like minimum wages, and began to make radical and extreme demands, like entry into the labor movement itself. The churches, at their worst, have all too often played a gadfly role. Being interested in black people today, the war in Vietnam tomorrow, and abortion reform the day after. The hope for a coalition between black people and white college students has failed to materialize, as far too many of the best of this latter group have demonstrated time and time again they are much more interested in music, drugs, the romantic rhetoric of revolution, and the ennobling sacrifice of self-enforced poverty than in the very real problems of human existence that afflict far too many poor people in this country today. So we are then left to our own devices to fall back on an ever spiraling scale which begins with politics, escalates to protests, culminates in rebellion with the probable result that increasing repression will follow. Here is a short description of how this process works, written by that eminent social scientist, Thomas Hayden. Says the people with fewest illusions about the welfare state are the poor who are served by it. When they protest, usually in the name of American ideals, an interesting reaction follows. Some among the majority react sympathetically, though not always with any real understanding of the causes, but a sufficient number of opposing interests are aroused to prevent any drastic changes, and often even more moderate changes are blocked. The poor, who in most cases begin by politely petitioning their governors, soon take much more drastic steps, thinking they can perhaps awaken the conscience of the majority. They do awaken the consciences of some people, and to some extent they force the elites to concede token changes. But at the same time, a counter-revolution is triggered against the potential of revolution, which has been seen in the mounting protests. The system then becomes deadlocked. No more than token reforms, crumbs, result for the protesters. The scale of their protest increases as they, what does this say? As they look for methods of transcending the pressure tactics that have not worked. They begin civil disobedience and disruption. The immediate reaction of the power structure is to maintain order. The police, the militia, are brought into the conflict. Considerations of social, political, or economic solutions to the problem are gradually replaced by the emphasis on law and order. At that point, violent repression becomes routine. It ought to be clear from that analysis that among the possible avenues of escape are revolutionary action, either classically violent on both sides of the question, or minimally speaking, a revolution in psychology, thinking, and political position on at least one side of the question. It is that second kind of revolution which is bursting upon us now and which of necessity must precede the first. It has its origins in the American black community. It is a revolution in our thinking about ourselves, a revolution turning upside down the perverse analysis that makes the victim describe himself as the cause of his own condition. It is found most concretely in the growing desire among black people to rid ourselves of the kind of tribalization of class and geography that has divided us for so long. 
and it is found in the growing impulse among black people to bring ourselves together as an ideological and cultural nation within this nation. But that kind of cultural revolution never does the job alone. We may, in concert with it, engage in a relatively nonviolent political revolution, taking over some of the major Black people in American Indians face the same kind of condition in a different kind of way. Uh, the justifiable and correct answer to the difficulties Indians face would be for all of us to leave. You see, this is their land. Uh, as John Wayne says, uh, they weren't using it correctly. See, uh, they didn't put up buildings on it and make automobiles run up and down and dump trash in the street. They weren't using it correctly. So white people were justified in taking it away from them. So the correct answer to the problems which Indians have would be for all of us to leave and uh, go back to wherever it was that we have our origins and to let them once again uh, uh, have free reign over the land and the water. As that's not likely to happen, uh, the next best answer, I, and I'm not really sure about this because I understand there's some debate among American Indians, is to allow the various American Indian communities that are scattered all over this United States some kind of cultural self-determination. The ability to decide whether or not they want to be red white men, you see, or whether they want to be red men which I would think would be very important for them. The other difference between the Indian and black people is that Indians are fighting for something which is theirs by right of possession, and we are fighting for something which is ours by right of dent of hard work and labor and sweat and 352 years of, uh, of cheap labor. Uh, and the only thing I think that could be done <coughs> to help simultaneously solve the problems these two groups face is to forge some sort of coalition among them and all the other non-white people in this country and all the people of a certain class in this country, which is difficult to do because they all face problems in a slightly different way. <coughs> the question asks for my observation of the effectiveness of minority recruitment plans on colleges and universities. Well, it seems to have tripled or doubled or quadrupled the numbers of black young people who get the opportunity to have a college education, for one thing. And although there's certainly the ratio of black and white people, young people who go to college, is nowhere being equal to their numbers of the general population, it certainly has increased the numbers of black kids who get the chance. And I think that's a benefit. Uh, such programs ought to be stepped up uh, at the same time that American education ought to be re-examining itself and asking the question of whether or why people have to go to college anyway, uh, as it seems that they do in order to achieve a certain income level. I suppose it's necessary, but it ought not be. Do I see any race riots of that, like Watts or Detroit, in the future? I do. There's one going to start tomorrow morning in Ames. Uh, no, I don't. I really don't know. I would very much doubt it, because I think uh, black people have learned a very painful lesson that you cannot clash, you cannot engage in open warfare with the police. I mean, it's self-defeating. Uh, people armed with uh, uh, World War II rifles and uh, and uh, homemade Molotov cocktails cannot conquer uh, most urban police forces. It's just not done. Pardon? The attitude of the Panthers? I don't know what you mean about the attitude of the Panthers. 
Well, the attitude of the Panthers is to combat the police, but not, I don't think, in the sense that you could compare what they intend to do or have done or will do with what occurred in Watts or Detroit or Newark. I mean, it's not the same thing. Well, the question asked for my own observations about the recent conflict between Huey P. Newton and Eldridge Cleaver and some observations about uh, uh, Jerry Rubin and Abby Hoffman. Is that right? Well, about the Cleaver-Newton uh, struggle, I don't know anything at all about it and don't understand it. I can't engage in all that dialectic. Uh, I can't follow it. It's difficult for me. Uh, I went to a southern black school and I can't follow all that rhetoric. I don't understand it. But I like to think that the Panthers very much like the NAACP or any organization constitute a family and that families shouldn't argue in the street. Families should argue at home and after they've had the argument then they tell their neighbors and their friends what they decided but they shouldn't argue in the street. About uh, Jerry Rubin and Abby Hoffman, I know them and I think they're fine young men. And the only critique I would make of uh, of them and wouldn't even call it a criticism is I think it's they border on playing, you know, which is dangerous sometimes. But uh, they're, in many ways, they're prophets, I think. They, a great many people now are behaving in a certain way because Jerry Rubin and Abby Hoffman behaved in a certain way two or three years ago. And I think generally it's worked out for the better, not for the worse. Yes. If I had to su suggest a s concrete way of forming a coalition between organized labor and blacks in the South, how would I do it? Well, I would try to seek out those black, those white workers uh, who are mistreated by their unions, those who work in plants that ran away from Connecticut and New York and Vermont and Massachusetts to settle in Alabama and Louisiana and Mississippi where they have company unions, uh, where even the regular unions are working hand in glove with the plant. And I would uh, suggest to them, uh, I wouldn't do this myself, I'd get some white organizer to do it. I would suggest to them that they're in bad economic shape, that their boss tells them that they're competing with black men for jobs, which is not true, that the boss is using them and black people to keep their wages down, that part of their difficulty is that they're living in a society which doesn't value labor anymore, uh, particularly the kind of labor these men are doing. Uh, I would uh, organize them into a, a different kind of union. I would travel throughout the rural south, bad little cities like Midnight and Louise and, and Kit Ketchum and uh, all those little places in Alabama and Mississippi and Louisiana. As a matter of fact, I know a fellow who's been doing this for four years. He just had a rally at the courthouse in Neshoba County, Mississippi. That's where Philadelphia, Mississippi is, where those three young men were killed. Uh, four years ago. He had 2,000 people there, all of them working people, 3,000 uh, 3, people there, I'm sorry, 1,500 of them were white working men and 1,500 of them were black working men and they seem to get along very well when they begin to realize that they have a common enemy. So I think it's just suggesting to them that they have a, a something in common with other groups of oppressed people. First it's suggesting that they're oppressed, which they reject right away. And then if they will accept that idea, suggest to them that they are common victims, uh, they are other victims of this oppression throughout the society. The future of what in the South? 
Well, the future of school integration is in the South is very much in doubt, particularly because uh, the Nixon administration has managed to do something I didn't think anyone could do. And that is to make two groups of Southerners opposed to school integration. Used to be that just white Southerners were opposed to school integration and black Southerners thought it desirable. Now both black and white Southerners are opposed to school integration, although I think most black Southerners think it's still a desirable goal, but not being done in the way it's being done now. Now, the Nixon administration quotes a great many statistics and figures to demonstrate that there are more black children attending integrated schools now than at any time since 1954. And that's partially true and partially not true. You know that uh, figures don't lie, uh, but liars do figure. And that's what's happening now. So I really don't know what the future is. Yes, sir. The question asks, what am I doing to clear up some of the absurdities of my profession, the practice of politics? Well, I really have little or nothing to do with what goes on in the Senate or the uh, House of the United States. I serve in a state legislature where we don't observe the senility system. So it's not a question with us. Uh, and uh, serve in a state legislature where the voting age uh, has been 18 for the past 23 years. Uh, which demonstrates more clearly than anything else that there's no virtue in being young. Uh, and I'm trying, uh, mostly in concert with other people, to eliminate some of the other absurdities that exist in a body like the Georgia legislature. Uh, but some of them have to do with tradition. And uh, as you n might guess, there are good traditions and bad traditions. And uh, some of them, uh, I think, are necessary to be retained, some of the traditions which we have are necessary to be retrained. They work for the good of the body uh, and not to the detriment of the body of the people we purport to represent. I could offer a solution, but I could offer no evidence whatsoever that it's workable or it's going to succeed or has a 50-50 chance of succeeding or failing or a 90-10 or 70-30 or 60-40 chance of succeeding or failing. I mean, I'm just, I'm not a wizard. I can't look into the future. Um, but I think the, uh, as much as I hate to sound like the late President Eisenhower, that the solution is found in two places, in the hearts and minds of men. Uh, no, that's the shadow. That's where evil lurks in the hearts and minds of innocent men. And in government. You see, if you live in a fascist state, a pseudo-democratic state like we do, a communist state, a socialist state, a state with any kind of political organization, decisions are made by people if it has some vestiges of democracy, but they're carried out by the government. So I think the solution to the problem of white racism lies in government. Government cannot eradicate racism from people's minds. It can only control it. For instance, I'm sure there's an anti-littering statute in Ames, and it means that some people who are naturally slovenly and lazy and want to throw uh, beer cans out of their automobiles don't do it because they know it's against the law. They are constrained from doing it by force of law. And I think government can do the same thing with racism. I'm sorry, I, I just couldn't hear that. What role do I think the press will play in the future? I think they'll be hard pressed to discover a role for themselves. <laughs> no, they will. I would think that the role they ought to be playing in the future is the trouble with so much reporting in this country, in the newspapers, the magazines, the TV, is they just tell you what happened, they don't tell you why it happened. And so we, a lot of us know pretty much what did happen, or at least part of what happened, but we seldom know what happened. I mean, why it happened. Uh, seldom know what motivated people to do this out of the other thing. So you'd like to hope that they'd be more of an...
uh, they'd explain things a little better to those of us uh, uh, so we'd know what's going on in the United States. It's an immense problem uh, having someone like Richard Nixon having the ability to make the Supreme Court what he wants it to be. Uh, they've already started taking steps backward. Uh, even though Hainsworth and Carswell couldn't get on there, the Minnesota Twins did. And they've already moved the court five or six paces to the right. This decision about public housing, uh, people in suburbs having referendums on public housing. Uh, is foolish. Another decision saying the juries can be instructed to impose capital punishment on defendants in capital cases is uh, another indication of a step backward, I think. And it's just frightening possibilities. things, I think, there are a couple of reasons why there are no big civil rights demonstrations as there were in the past. First, because they tend not to be as useful in doing what they did then. And secondly, because a great deal of the activity in what was called, uh, or what is called the civil rights movement is now occurring in very small places and local levels and neighborhoods and communities, rather than in cities and states and across regions. So as the civil rights movement lost its regional character, and uh, lost its uh, uh, statewide character and became more localized, and the necessity and the impulse of people to do those kinds of things just disappeared. No, it happened because from 1961 through 1964 or 5, really, uh, four organizations ran the Southern Civil Rights Movement. And that's not to say that they dictated what would be done. But the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the Congress of Racial Equality, the NAACP, and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference had projects operating in each of the southern states. Now these, op these organizations, with the exception of the NAACP, have all declined. They've declined in membership. They've declined in activity. They uh, adopt uh, much more of a hit-and-run technique now than they used to. They don't stay and wait and work as hard as they used to. So I think it's a, an organizational dysfunction which has occurred. That happened because, uh, for a variety of reasons, too complicated to go into now. I, I didn't hear the last. A lot of people told me not to say it anymore because when I went to college campus, this same group of inactive students would dislike me. But it's turned out they're so inactive they don't. statement made by a noted figure in the movement who once said that the position, proper position of women in the movement was prone, when I think what he probably meant was supine, unless, of course, it was a matter of some personal preference of his. Uh, I disagree with that. I don't think, uh, although there, I'm, there, I know there are many people who agree with me, I don't think there's that much of a uh, of sexual uh, competition uh, among, uh, not among younger black people anyway. Uh, it used to be the phenomenon, of course, that black women were more educated than black men, uh, and that even uneducated black women could secure employment, however lowly paid, when black men couldn't secure any. And that caused, quite naturally, a great deal of uh, in-house competition and sexual, a uh, great deal of sexual frustration and uh, competition. But I think it's disappearing. So I just, I would disagree with that. 
I don't want women behind me. I would like to walk behind them. Well, thank you all very much. There will be a business symposium starting in the South Ballroom at 1.30. There will be representatives from Iowa Industries and a student panel discussing the free enterprise system. And tomorrow at noon, uh, Abby Hoffman on the other side of the Campanile. toward control and sensible spending and so on. And the advocates of transferring the onus of taxation to a echelon of government removed from those who spend it, I think, is unwise. I think there are arguments for it. But any time you place the spending at one level and the onus for collecting that tax at another level, you remove the repugnance of overspending because they don't have to worry about raising the tax. Also, I would hope that local control is not lost, that local control is not conveyed or bestowed upon the state in federal law. Certainly, if there's something that's close to the minds and hearts of the people, it's the education of our youth. And I would hope and pray that local control is retained in the state and the local districts and areas, larger though they may be and should be, certainly not turning it over entirely to the legislature or state government or the federal government to decide in its entirety what it's going to be taught and how it's going to be taught in our schools. Beyond that, I think I can agree with much of what uh, Cliff said. With respect to Dr. Van Allen's remarks, I pick out several of the things that he cites, and I saw this just at the beginning of the program. He cites that uh, his belief is that uh, we should try to break our blind devotion to the idea that extended formal education for everyone is the only route to self-fulfillment and success. And then he cites uh, two other areas to work toward acceptable sociological substitutes for mere attendance at college, and finally to foster a wide diversity of vocational, technical, and other specialized forms of education. I think until we convince business and industry who place such a premium on the sheepskin, we don't really say many times, uh, was he a good student, but the choice between a very capable potential employee without the degree and one with the degree who gets the job. I think until this attitude is changed, you're going to find a quest and a demand by everyone to obtain college education because they feel that it's a door open, right or wrong. The sign says stop. I will close with this remark. I believe that the greatest change that came in education in the last two decades was the GI Bill of Rights. I think it provided an opportunity for countless thousands to attend college regardless of where they came from or their means. And I think what it did is gave stimulus for many of their children to realize that they could and should attain higher education. I predict by the year 2001, the state of Iowa will provide for every citizen of this state free public education through four years of college. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Frommel. I see that he's detected that the communications gap is probably greater between state agencies, local government, our office, than it is between 
us and let's say the moon. We now have some limited time for questions from the audience. We have placed microphones at either place so that if any person of the audience would like to pose a question, directing it either specifically or a general question to be answered by one of the panelists or respondents, uh, we certainly recognize you at this point. Would you raise your hand? Uh, there certainly must be some questions. committee have any questions? If not, I would lead off by directing one to Dr. Van Allen. I was very fascinated by his emphasis upon the need to coordinate work and study. Uh, uh, just uh, off the top of my head, Dr. Van Allen, whom do you think should take the initiative in this uh, effort? Should it be the schools, uh, the educational, the professional leaders? Should it be the business community? Should it be the uh, political community, uh, how do we get the ball rolling? Ms. Pearson, I, I, I think that's a very tough problem, and uh, of course, uh, that's I understand what your commission is charged with doing. We are, uh <laughs> we're, we're, we're sort of hit and run uh <laughs> uh, components of the system here, but I, I might sort of uh, rattle a little bit about the kind of thing uh, one might visualize. Uh, I, I think it's going to be very difficult to have a, have a company devote, say, one day a week of an employee's time and pain for sitting there studying and working in the shop and learning some new wrinkle on his craft or understanding uh, machine shop trigonometry or something of this character. That's the kind of thing I'm really thinking about uh, now uh, because uh, I, I think it's a competitive uh, matter and uh, paying out money to teach people to learn their trade is really not a by and large, a traditional pattern of industry and business. It is in some noteworthy examples, and I think it could be a good deal more so. Now, it may very well be that, uh, for example, the state government in Iowa could take some kind of leadership by, by I've used the word fostering in my uh, paper. Now, I realize that's not a very explicit word, uh, but I'm thinking there it might even subsidize in-plant uh, education of essentially a technical direct character for those who really want to do it. And uh, I, I think the burden of my comments in a, is a way is the following, and I, I find I, I am, I believe, I have, uh, had, and it running in a somewhat different chain of thought than Senator Promulter's here. Uh, personally, I, uh, I do not think even 40% of the human race is uh, interested in college work, is interested in reading Chaucer in the original and really uh, is appropriately supported by public funds at the up to age 21, 22. I, I think we ought to put these, uh, we ought to kind of twist things around somehow by whatever measures we can devise to, to really put these young people to work where they, they get into something they really uh, ha have some mastery of. And I see too many uh, students in my own classes who are there fundamentally against their will and again, and contrary to their own aspirations, it wouldn't very helpful. Would it? <laughs> <coughs> I've uh, noted a question from uh, Representative Radel. Can you hear him? Would you mute the mic, please? Question or discussion is useless if we can't hear it. Do you hear me now? Yes. I agree with your work study suggestion for students and workers, but isn't this a, even more important where teachers and college professors are concerned? Should not they be required to take a sabbatical, say, every three years with full pay? gain some work experience in their specialties as well? I am obviously not going to oppose that suggestion, but, uh, uh <laughs> but uh, I, I should like to say that many of us really attempt to do that on a more or less regular basis by dividing our efforts during the course of every week among, let's say, straight duties, working right in the classroom, and thinking and learning our subject, which we call research.
question over here. Would you announce your name, please? Gia. I would direct this question at uh, Dr. Van Allen's comments have prompted it, although I would welcome comments from anybody. We have uh, heard in our local level K through 12 program. Now, would you have a comment, Dr. Van Allen, on whether we should uh, start here, say, in the eighth or ninth grade, to directly counsel some of these children away for uh, away from the college aspiration? I personally fear a European system coming out of this by the year 2001, where we separate at too early an age. Would you have a comment on this type of counseling and uh, its direction? I think you're referring to the, what's called the 10 plus decision in England where every youngster at the age of 10 or thereabouts is definitely uh, split between an academic career, so that's a pro academic professional career and a technical or uh, uh, so to speak blue collar career at that point. Now, uh, well, uh, I, I admit that's a kind of an implication of what I've been, been saying, although I'm thinking of it myself at a rather higher age than 10 or 12, something like this, uh, perhaps in mid-high school level, something of this uh, magnitude. Um, I don't know how to do this properly. I, uh, I'm very skeptical myself of, uh, of counseling and counselors, some of whom may be, uh, <laughs> may be present. Uh, uh <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, I'm skeptical on very specific grounds, seeing how my own children have been counseled by uh, school counselors. Uh, I am in the business in some sense of being a counselor myself, but believe me, I do not take it that seriously. I mean, I do not take myself that seriously because I know, I don't even know what I want to do or should do, much less telling anyone else. So I, I think this matter of counseling is, is honestly overdone. I, I, I think somehow or other we have to get the system such that it is a uh, quite a sensible thing to go off and learn to be a, a good machinist. I'm, I'm deeply fond of good machinists. I'm a kind of an amateur machinist myself. And uh, right now in our department at the university, we have much greater difficulty in finding a, a first-rate instrument maker than we do a PhD in nuclear physics. It's very much easier. <laughs> and uh, I think this is the indicative of the whole state of the United States, is that the, the, the quality of craftsmanship and doing a good job in a, in a dirty shirt is just uh, lost in our system somehow. I don't know how to get that back, but I know lots of young people who are just great with their hands and, and creative and skillful, but somehow they're tortured by the system into, into studying Chaucer. I don't want to pick on Chaucer too much today, but let me say studying physics. Eh? <laughs> and uh, Well, uh, that's a poor answer, but that's the way I feel about the uh, response. Uh, Are there any other comments from the panelists or respondents? Anyone? Senator Fama? Well, ju just like to make one comment. I think it goes back to education. I know for a fact in discussing it with children attending school that uh, a good nuclear 